hang in there. Our reading today is from the psalm, Psalm 63. O God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, maybe when you're doing your examine, <clears throat> for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O gracious God, in the hearing of your holy word, we thirst to hear more. May your word become living water for us as we have come to know that living water in Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. People who draw blood, like Margie over here, you know it helps to be hydrated, all right? If the body's all dried up, it's hard to find that vein and get the needle in there and get that blood out. Because <laughs> the body needs water. And we know, all know, what happens when we become dehydrated, that it can be a very dangerous situation. Before I turn again to the question of thirst, I want to remind us of my encouragement that you participate every day in the prayer for examine, that you spend 15 minutes or so every evening, that you spend the first few minutes relishing your day, thinking back on your day and the blessings that you receive from God, your gratitude for life and for God's gift in life. That you then move to a request, asking God to be present with you as you look back over your day, that God's presence and spirit might open your heart and mind to perhaps see something or hear something you need to see or hear. And then you review your day, the third R, you look back over your day and you find those places where perhaps you failed or made mistakes, big or small, and you spend time repenting of those, the fourth R, asking God's forgiveness. And then finally you resolve that the next day will be better. Today is the third Sunday in Lent, and if you read your devotions from the devotional book, which we gave you as a gift, as we do each year, um, you'll recall that the passage from the Gospel of Luke uh, was with regard to the fig tree uh, that stopped producing figs. And uh, the word is to cut that fig tree down, because it's not bearing fruit, it's not being productive. And the devotional this morning says that um, the vine dresser begs that it not be cut down yet, to be patient with that fig tree, uh, to give it another year, uh, give it a little more time to do its exam, to look at its life, to review its life, to be grateful for life, and to resolve that you will bear fruit. That fig tree, like all of life, needs water. That fig tree, like all of us, need water to survive. 
These bodies that are made up of 65% water, we cannot live unless we have water. The opposite can happen to your body too. You can actually drink too much water. You can become water intoxicated. And you can end up with some of the same symptoms as you are when you're dehydrated. That rarely happens. It doesn't happen near as much as dehydration. But we know how it is in July and August in North Carolina when you walk out in 30 seconds, your shirt soaked through. You're losing water. You need hydration to survive. How often water we encounter it throughout God's holy scripture in, in the creation itself, in the very first verses of the book of Genesis, it says God moved across the face of the waters because they existed before creation. Water was there. God moved across the face of the waters and brought forth life. God liberates his people through water, does he not? Mm -hmm. As Moses goes through the sea, the waters are parted, the people are freed out of Egypt and sent toward a new land. But while for 40 years they're in the wilderness, they get thirsty. And in Exodus chapter 17, we read that brief story about how God's people become thirsty. They start grumbling against Moses. Say, did you lead us out of slavery so we'll simply thirst to death out here in the desert? And what happens? The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so the people may drink. Who ever heard of water coming out of a rock? But there in the desert, there in the wilderness, there among the rocks, God pours out living water for his people. You know what it's like to be thirsty. It's not very fun at all. I mean, your body begins to dry up, and the more you think about it, the, the thirstier you get. I remember growing up in the Philippines, and we would go to this mountainous area for a break occasionally, called Baguio, and you couldn't drink the water there. And we would make this long trip up to Baguio, you know, I was just a little kid, and when we got to the little cottage where missionaries could stay, the first thing my mother would do would be to draw water, which was polluted, you couldn't drink it. I mean, around this world, people can't drink water. They get dysentery, they get typhoid, they get cholera, uh, the waters of this world are horribly polluted, and, and they'll make you sick, and so they have to be treated. Uh, even water in our areas are treated, because they'll otherwise make you sick. Of course, some of the treatment may make you sick, too. But um, we would get to Baguio, and the first thing Mom would do is she'd draw up this big container, put it on the stove of water, put it on the stove, and, and it would start to boil, because you had to boil away the bad bacteria that we cause dysentery or typhoid. And I remember as a kid just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting for that water to boil. And it had to boil 10 or 15 minutes before it was sterile where you could drink it. And not only that, it had to cool back down before you could drink it. And the longer you waited and watched that water, the thirstier you got. The desire for water, the thirst that we have. And I'm talking, as you know, today not just about that physical thirst, but it's the spiritual thirst that all of us carry with us in life. The thirst for something that can <coughs> truly give us life, that can satisfy us. The examine that I've presented to you and that I hope you might be using is one way of satisfying <clears throat> spiritual thirst. As we look at our lives, as we give gratitude, as we examine our lives, as we seek repentance and forgiveness and resolve 
to live a better life. The Psalms are filled with stories about water and references and symbolism to water, and some of them I'd like to read to you just briefly. From Psalm 42, we hear these words, As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. You remember the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me where? Beside still waters. He restores my soul. Psalm 78, we hear these words from Psalm 78 about water. 78 verses uh, 15 and 16. He split rocks open in the wilderness. Where's that story from? Exodus chapter 17 and his people in the wilderness. He splits rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. The prophet Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah loves the symbolism of water and thirst. We read from Isaiah chapter uh, 48, verse 21. Isaiah 48, 21. We hear these words. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split open the rock and the water gushed out. Isaiah 41, verses 17 and 18, we hear these words. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. The Gospel of John, one of my favorite Gospels because of its symbolism of water, What's the first miracle that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John at the wedding at Cain of Galilee? Turns water <coughs> into wine. A symbolism for John of the water of Jesus' body that flows in blood from the cross. It becomes living water for you and for me. Do you remember those stories in John's Gospel that Jesus goes to a well and he meets there a Samaritan woman? And he says to her, ma'am, give me a drink. And for her it's strange because in public a man shouldn't be talking to a woman, but even worse so in this case because she's a Samaritan woman. And Jesus says to, to, to her, I can give you living water. And you'll never have to come again to this well to draw water. And the woman says to Jesus, give me that water. And Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty the water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. These images that we have throughout Scripture of water and of thirst reminds us in this season of Lent that there is so much for which we are thirsty as God's people. We thirst for fulfillment of purpose in life. We thirst for love. We thirst for forgiveness. We thirst for true and honest companionship. We thirst for joy in life. We thirst 
for spiritual fulfillment. May the living Christ in this season of Lent satisfy your thirst in your times of prayer, in your times of devotion, in your times of examine. May Christ come to you with the living water that your thirst might be satisfied through him. Here again, these scripture verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We hear the Apostle Paul as he writes these words. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Mm -hmm. and then these words again from the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. I began this morning by saying that the Bible begins Genesis 1 with water. God's Spirit moves across the face of the water which exists before creation. And out of that water, God creates life. The Bible ends in Revelation chapter 21 with these words. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha and the Omega. The first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I was there in creation and I will be there in new creation. I was there in Genesis and I'm there in Revelation. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Now are you thirsty? Come on and help me. We've got water for everybody. Mm -hmm.